watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. And by viewers like you. The title of my uh, remarks tonight, uh, as you may have noticed, is the question, will there ever be peace in the Middle East? I wonder if, if you wouldn't mind um, answering the question for me uh, at the start, and we'll see if I can change your mind in the process. How many of you actually believe that there will be peace in the Middle East? That's astounding. Normally, when I speak and ask that question, the most people, uh, the vast majority, do not put up their hands. I, too, uh, have tended, as Father Von Ox uh, pointed out, in the 35 years of my life that I have spent uh, devoted to the effort to try to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict, that it is indeed uh, possible. Uh, and certainly uh, that optimism uh, has been informed uh, both by a sense of history in which if one looks at the, takes the long view, one can see that from the days of the, of the 1970s when Henry Kissinger negotiated disengagement agreements between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Syria to the Israel-Egypt peace treaty, to the Oslo Accords that President Clinton presided over, the signing ceremony for on the White House lawn of September 13, 1993, to the Israel-Jordan peace treaty of 10 months later, uh, to the Arab League resolution in, in uh, 2000, I'm in, yes, in 2003, uh, where the Arab states declared that they were ready to make peace and recognize uh, Israel. Uh, one can see that there has been a steady trend towards reconciliation. And certainly uh, in the last, at the beginning of last year, uh, I believed that there was a new chance to try to achieve a breakthrough to peace. Uh, President Obama, on his second day in office, as many of you may recall, declared that peacemaking in the Middle East would be one of his highest priorities. And he appointed George Mitchell to be his special envoy for Middle East peace uh, as a manifestation of that commitment. Uh, on the Palestinian side, there was a moderate leadership led by uh, Mahmoud Abbas, also known as Abu Mazen, uh, who was committed to ending the conflict with Israel and was strongly opposed to uh, violence and terrorism or armed struggle, as Palestinians would call it, as a way of trying to resolve the conflict. He had appointed a Palestinian Prime Minister, Salam Fayyad, who was dedicated to the proposition of uh, building transparent, accountable, responsible Palestinian institutions and security forces that could serve as reliable partners to Israel in making peace. On the Israeli side, Bibi Netanyahu had been elected Prime Minister for a second time. I had served uh, uh, as US Ambassador in Israel the first time he was elected Prime Minister. It was not a, a pleasant experience uh, for me. But uh, 
second time around, there was a hope that some of you may recall that he would become, uh, he would do uh, as President Nixon did when he uh, reached out to China and, and, and built the relationship there, that Bibi Netanyahu as a right-wing politician uh, could make peace in a way that left-wing politicians like Yitzhak Rabin or Ehud Barak had always found difficult. Um, and he had, uh, in his uh, second month in office, declared that he too would accept the idea of a Palestinian state. Uh, as I already mentioned, the Arab states had all declared their willingness to make peace with Israel and to recognize it and to end the conflict with Israel, provided Israel withdrew from the territories occupied as a result of the 1967 Six-Day War. And a majority of Israelis and Palestinians still believed in the two-state solution, that is to say the creation of an independent Palestinian state alongside uh, the Jewish state of Israel. And finally, uh, because fear is a much greater motivator in the Middle East than hope, there was the fear of Iran, which I thought a year ago could serve as a uh, common uh, threat to both the Arabs and to Israel in a way that might give them the incentive to work together to resolve their conflicts so as to better deal with the uh, threat from Iran, whether it be Iran's nuclear ambitions, uh, whether it be Iran's ambitions to dominate the region as a Shia Persian country seeking to exert its influence in the Sunni heartland through the most sensitive areas in uh, Gaza and in Lebanon. Uh, and indeed in Iraq as well, that um, the Iranian threat was not just to Israel but to the Sunni Arab leaders as well and that this would give them an incentive, both sides an incentive, to uh, find common ground and, and resolve their conflicts. Uh, on Israel's northern border, Syria, uh, and the Syrian leader has been for some five years uh, declaring his interest in making peace with Israel. And the previous government, uh, Israeli government of Ehud Olmert, had also uh, engaged in indirect negotiations under Turkish auspices with the Syrian president and had made significant progress towards uh, the resumption of negotiations uh, on the Syrian track. Uh, and the Israeli defense establishment was particularly committed to the idea of making peace with Syria, uh, even though they understood very well that that would require Israel's full withdrawal from the Golan Heights in northern Israel, uh, because of their belief that to make peace with Syria would uh, lead to the cutting of the conduit between Iran and its proxies, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in Gaza, because Syria was in fact the critical conduit for those relationships. Uh, Hamas has its external headquarters in Damascus. The arms pipeline flows from Iran to Hezbollah through Damascus. And so the was any number of reasons, whether it was political or strategic, uh, or just a desire to end the conflict, that led me to hope that with an American president who was determined to help the parties to make peace, that it was now finally possible uh, to achieve a comprehensive end to the conflict. 
One year later, uh, it's hard to be optimistic uh, about the chances for negotiated uh, peace agreements. Um, and I have to admit to you that uh, I am, for the first time, uh, beginning to think it actually may be too late to try to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through a negotiated peace agreement that establishes a, a, a two-state solution. Um, I say that first because uh, in the book that I wrote, looking back at the eight years of Clinton's efforts to make peace in the Middle East, uh, of which I was intimately involved, I came to a conclusion, it was one of several conclusions, but it was probably the most important, that peace cannot be achieved in the Middle East simply by the will of an American president. That it requires leadership uh, on the part of Arab and Israeli leaders. It requires statesmanship. When Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin were prepared to lead their people to peace and take the risks involved in that, risks that led to the uh, assassination of Anwar Sadat, then it was possible for Jimmy Carter, working with them, uh, with his own deep commitment to peacemaking, to actually uh, achieve the Israel-Egypt Peace Treaty. When Yitzhak Rabin and King Hussein of Jordan decided that they would take the risks and manifest the courage necessary to lead their people to peace, risks which led to the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, Bill Clinton was able to work with them and achieve an Israel-Jordan peace agreement. But absent that leadership, and it was absent in those days, uh, absent from Bibi Netanyahu to Yasser Arafat to Hafez al-Assad of Syria, uh, then with all the will uh, that President Clinton brought to bear, it wasn't possible. And unfortunately today, uh, President Obama has discovered that his will is not enough to overcome the uh, unwillingness of uh, leaders in the region to take the necessary political risks that would uh, produce circumstances in which peace uh, could be achieved. Um, he discovered this the hard way. Um, perhaps the biggest shock to him was when he went to Saudi Arabia in a little reported event. He, he went to Saudi Arabia the day before he made that famous speech in Cairo, uh, reaching out to the Muslim world, and he spoke to King Abdullah and he said to him, I'm ready to fly high and fast to try to resolve this conflict, but I can't do it without your help. You've put forward this Arab League initi peace initiative. I need you to come with me, to work with me, to join me in the effort to resolve this conflict. Uh, and I need you to be prepared to come and meet with Bibi Netanyahu and, and, and Abu Mazen and, and to try to resolve it. And King Abdullah said, uh, he didn't just say no, he said hell no. Uh, he said he didn't trust Netanyahu, he didn't trust Abu Mazen, he tried to, to help Abu Mazen and uh, uh, that help had been rejected. Uh, he observed Netanyahu's behaviour when he was Prime Minister before and he wasn't going to do anything until and unless the President achieved a peace agreement and then he would think about uh, doing his part. Uh, but uh, he wasn't the only 
uh, leader in the region that lacked uh, the courage uh, to act. Uh, Abu Mazen facing a deep and abiding split within the Palestinian polity between his own nationalist party, Fatah, and the Islamist fundamentalist party of Hamas, a split manifested geographically in Hamas controlling Gaza and Fatah controlling the West Bank. That split essentially makes it very difficult, if not impossible, for Abu Mazen to enter negotiations and make the compromises necessary to achieve an agreement because he is always looking over his shoulder at the, uh, critis the potential criticism of Hamas that he is betraying the Palestinian cause, selling out by uh, making peace uh, with the Israelis. Uh, and so he, he is uh, weak and finds it very difficult to move forward. On the Israeli side, Bibi Netanyahu can make peace. He can bring the Israeli people along because he's a right-wing leader. And he will automatically have the support of the center and the left. But the problem with, with uh, Bibi is that he sees himself as uh, Churchill uh, rather than Ben-Gurion. What do I mean by that? Um, he is much more concerned today at the threat from Iran, uh, a, an existential threat to Israel. And so he's in his Churchillian mode of warning against the gathering storm, uh, rather than in, a, uh, uh, in following in the steps of Ben-Gurion, or for that matter Yitzhak Rabin, or even Menachem Begin, in terms of being ready to take the hard decisions involving uh, giving up substantial territory uh, in order to achieve peace, uh, in particular with the Palestinians, but with the Syrians as well. In my experience with, with Netanyahu, uh, in the Clinton years, he was particularly worried about uh, his relationship with President Clinton, which was a problematic one. And indeed, when his government collapsed, uh, he was punished by the Israeli electorate for mishandling his relationship with President Clinton. And he lost the, his re-election bid. So he came into office this time very worried that his government would collapse again and very concerned about not repeating uh, the mistake of mishandling his relationship with the President of the United States. But then something happened. See, President Obama uh, was, was much more concerned about rebuilding America's relationship with the Arab and Muslim world, a relationship that had been severely damaged damaged in the Bush years, uh, and saw that as a priority, but failed to uh, pay attention to the way in which that effort, a laudable and important effort in my view, uh, he failed to see how that was perceived in Israel as an attempt to distance the United States from Israel in order to curry favor in the Arab and Muslim world. And so Netanyahu found himself in a situation in which the Israeli public, not because of anything he did or didn't do, but because of what I would call inadvertence on the part of, of President Obama, uh, Netanyahu found himself in a situation rare for Israeli leaders where he was more popular in Israel than the American president. President Clinton, President Bush, 
enjoyed 70 to 80 percent popularity in Israel. Uh, depending on which uh, poll you believe, President Obama uh, enjoys somewhere between uh, 7 percent and uh, 30 percent support in Israel. Um, and that's despite the fact that he has done the right thing by Israel when it comes to this existential threat from Iran. Uh, but through a, uh, as I say, an inadvertence or a lack of attention to the way in which his policies were playing in the Israeli street, he lost the Israeli public. And that created a circumstance in which Netanyahu, who used to always weigh his relationship with the United States against his relationship with his right wing, left him in a situation where he didn't have to worry about his relationship with the United States, and so he became preoccupied with pressure from his right wing. Netanyahu used to tell me when I served as ambassador and he was prime minister that Israeli politics are tribal. And you have to, if you want to uh, retain the allegiance of your tribe, you have to feed them. You have to toss them bones. This was his way of explaining to me why he had to undertake settlement activity that was causing such heartburn in Washington at the time to feed his right-wing tribe. Uh, President Obama insisted on a settlements freeze, and Netanyahu responded to that by uh, agreeing to a moratorium for 10 months. But having angered his right wing by doing that, he had to feed them bones. And that's why you see uh, the, all of this activity in Jerusalem, of building in Jerusalem, as a way of buying off his right wing. That's why he uh, comes out last week and announces that uh, the um, tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron and Rachel's tomb in uh, Bethlehem uh, will be on the Israeli national heritage list, um, therefore provoking the Palestinians by signaling that he intends to keep control of those uh, places um, in the West Bank. Uh, and so that's uh, a situation in which Abu Mazen, concerned about his right wing, his Hamas opposition, and Bibi, concerned about his right wing, find themselves uh, trapped by their domestic politics and unable or unwilling uh, to move forward, even to begin again the direct negotiations. And so George Mitchell finds himself in a situation where he has to try uh, for proximity talks. He's about to depart for the region again to try to get these proximity talks going. What are proximity talks? Uh, that's where he, as the mediator, will shuffle, shuttle between uh, Bibi Netanyahu in his office in Jerusalem and Abu Mazen in his office up the road, 30 minutes up the road in Ramallah, uh, and try to uh, mediate in a way that gets negotiations going again. Uh, most of you aren't old enough to remember the last time there were proximity talks between Arabs and Israelis. It was in 1948 after the War of Independence. And the idea that we are now going back to that after the Oslo Accords, after 12 years of negotiations, direct negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians, is shocking and depressing and indicative of how far uh, things have slipped back, how stuck we appear to be. Um, We have a similar problem on the Syrian track, where uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, talks about making peace, but uh, 
the day after he receives uh, Bill Burns, the Under Secretary of State, who comes bearing a letter from President Obama uh, expressing uh, America's desire to have a normalized relationship with Syria. Uh, and the day after we announced that we're sending back our ambassador to Damascus, Assad hosts Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, and Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, for a, uh, a feast in, uh, in Damascus uh, to demonstrate that he can have it both ways. Uh, a developing relationship with the United States and a strong and close relationship with Iran and Hezbollah. Uh, that he can talk about peace with Israel to one audience and war with Israel to another. That's a comfortable position for him to be in, uh, but it's not one that can, uh, uh, on its own, produce a meaningful breakthrough to peace with Israel. He will have to decide which side of the fence he wants to be on uh, if he's to make peace. And similarly, on the Israeli side, Netanyahu uh, doesn't face uh, much of a challenge at the moment from his right-wing settlers when it comes to the Golan Heights, but he does face a challenge from his key coalition partner, uh, the foreign minister, Yvette Lieberman, who uh, has made it clear that even the hint of moving forward towards a deal with Syria will lead him to leave the party, leave the government, and uh, with his 15 seats, that will bring down Netanyahu's government. So here on the Syrian track as well, you have a situation of uh, stalemate uh, with a little a prospect that things are going to move forward, uh, let alone to a breakthrough uh, for peace. Saudi Arabia and the other Arabs are indeed worried about Iran. I would say deeply concerned about Iran's nuclear ambitions and its efforts to establish its dominance in their part of the Middle East. But they are not, because of those circumstances, they are not willing to be exposed uh, by engaging with Israel and the Palestinians in what they expect will be a negotiation that leads nowhere. For them, that uh, only will weaken them further. You see, there is a battle of narratives going on between Iran and these uh, Sunni uh, Arab leaders. The Iranians and their Hezbollah and Hamas proxies declare to the Arab street, our way works. Violence, terrorism, defiance of, of the United States and the international community, threats to destroy Israel. That's the way to liberate Palestine and provide dignity to the Arab people. The competing narrative is the one of moderation, reconciliation, uh, peace and recognition of Israel under American auspices. And that narrative doesn't have a lot of credibility as long as there's no breakthrough to peace agreements. And so what the Arabs and leaders are not prepared to do is expose themselves to a process that will only reinforce the narrative uh, that the Iranians propagate. Uh, finally, there is those majorities on both sides that support a two-state solution. That's always been my last resort when everything else doesn't work. I say, oh, but there's still a majority on both sides that support a two-state solution. And that's true. But lately I've been kind of drilling down to see what the majorities on both sides feel about the critical issues that made it impossible for us to uh, achieve a breakthrough back at the end of the Clinton administration. There are two issues there. The Palestinian demand for a right of return of the Palestinian refugees to Israel 
and the uh, issue of Jerusalem, particularly the disposition of the holy sites in Jerusalem, and particularly that area that's known as the Temple Mount, Haram al-Sharif. Temple Mount is the holiest place in Judaism, uh, where the uh, ruins of the Second Temple are uh, believed to be, and the western wall of the temple, which is where, um, of course, Jews pray. It's the holiest place in Judaism. Uh, the surface of that Temple Mount is where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is, which is the third holiest place in Islam. And so uh, we're talking about the same piece of territory that both sides claim as uh, religiously um, critically important to their beliefs. Um, and if you drill down and ask Israelis and Palestinians what they're prepared to accept on those two issues, you discover that even though they support peace and a two-state solution, they do not agree. They are far apart on those two issues. In fact, further apart today than they were back at the uh, end of the Clinton administration when President Clinton put down his parameters for resolving these issues. So, if one reviews that list of um, uh, realities that exist today that have been exposed by the Obama effort to try to achieve breakthroughs on the Palestinian and Syrian tracks, one has to be uh, fairly pessimistic. Uh, and short of a major crisis that will stir things up, uh, I don't see how we get from where we are today to a negotiated peace agreement, either between Israel and the Palestinians or between Israel and Syria. But uh, there is some important positive news and reason for hope. Uh, and it lies uh, by looking, by lowering one's sights to what's happening on the ground. And there you see a different picture. There you see in the West Bank a Palestinian authority that is uh, building the institutions of governance in a credible, responsible, transparent way with the help of the US armed forces and the Jordanians and the US taxpayers, us, uh, building a credible Palestinian security force that has established order in all of the major uh, population centers, towns and villages, cities of the West Bank, that is working closely with the Israeli army to uh, counter efforts in particular by Hamas and other uh, radical uh, groups to launch violence and terrorism from the West Bank. And uh, that is building confidence between uh, uh, Israelis and West Bank Palestinians in a way that has not existed even in the good old days of the Oslo Accords. And as the Israeli army removes roadblocks and, and the flow of people and commerce uh, improves, we see today in the West Bank, uh, in this quarter, there will be double-digit growth in the Palestinian economy in the West Bank, which is something that we here have every reason to be jealous of. Uh, indeed, when Salam Fayyad spoke, this is the Palestinian Prime Minister, at the Herzliya conference, this is the annual conference in which uh, all Israel's leaders come and, and uh, give their prescription for Israel's future. He spoke there uh, about what he was doing in the West Bank. And he received a tumultuous standing ovation uh, from the Israelis in the audience. 
when the Israeli uh, Chief of General Staff of the Army uh, praises the Palestinian security forces for their efforts uh, in the West Bank, then you know something is changing. Even in Gaza, uh, where Hamas rules, uh, something interesting is happening. <clears throat> Hamas today has stopped all uh, attacks from Gaza into Israel, not just by its own forces, but by other groups that are there. Uh, Palestine Islamic Jihad, uh, Al Qaeda, um, groups uh, and the rest. Uh, and that is, I think, an indication of a trend where Hamas is moving from fighting Israel to feeding the Palestinians of Gaza that it now has responsibility for. That is to say, it's moving from being a terrorist organization to a government with responsibilities. And therein lies a key, I think, to uh, stabilizing the situation there, lifting the siege, and uh, improving the situation of, of Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, as I said at the beginning, fear is always a greater motivator than hope. And as the Iranians move closer and closer to acquiring a nuclear weapon, and the international community, led by the United States, moves towards more robust sanctions and a, uh, a more confrontational uh, period, uh, the need to find a way to move forward on the Palestinian front uh, becomes uh, more important, both for the Arabs and for the United States and for Israel. Because as the threat grows, the common interest in dealing with the threat can yet provide uh, a basis for reconciliation. And so, as hard as I try to be pessimistic, I still think there is a chance for peace in the Middle East. And that's also because something always turns up in the Middle East in my 35 years of experience. It's usually bad, but sometimes it's good. I want to close by quoting Shimon Peres, the current president of Israel. Uh, I worked very closely with him uh, back in the 1990s when we were trying to make peace. He was Yitzhak Rabin's partner in that effort. And he said to me at, at the end of the administration when we were trying to get Arafat and Barak to uh, agree to uh, uh, the final deal, he said that history is like a horse that gallops past your window. And the true test of statesmanship is if the leaders are prepared to jump from the window onto that galloping horse. Now, if you think about it, it's not such an easy proposition, jumping onto a galloping horse from a window. Uh, that's the nature of the challenge in the Middle East. Uh, nowhere more so than today, given the circumstances I've described. But I do believe that both circumstances there and the commitment of an American president to do his best to uh, get history's horse to gallop past their window will put these leaders to the test and we may yet see them jump onto that galloping horse. At least I hope so. Thank you very much.